I want to give you what I'm going to say in the sermon, and then I'm going to sermon it. Uh, there is a, a song, uh, a hymn that we heard this morning. Um, For the one who knows me best loves me most. For the one who knows me best loves me most. Uh, what I want to offer you this morning is a discovery of mine. Uh, it's not new, it's not original, but it is for me. Um, and that is when we come to know God, to love Him, and then in turn to be loved by Him, to be forgiven by Him, then we can begin to know and to love and to forgive ourselves, and therefore we can begin to know, to love, and forgive others. And that's the sermon. Thank you. English Standard Version, Psalm 1914, has always been my favorite. It says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. And then it calls God Rock. God Rock is one of the oldest addresses to God found in the Scriptures. Rock and place are the two oldest. So this, this goes back a ways. So I would be honored that you would pray that with me now out loud. Would you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. By the way, I found out why over all the years people said, well, why don't you do the walk-around preaching thing? Well, I always had a, an oak pulpit so that you wouldn't know how nervous I am. So I could hang on, seriously, I could hang on to it. Hanging on to a music stand when you're my size is not a healthy thing. I... I Sorry. So, you, what do you do with your hands when you don't have an oak pulpit? Yeah. yeah. So, we're looking this morning at who's last. Um, in this 22nd chapter of Matthew, there are three encounters that Jesus has with small groups. I'm going to talk about these groups a little bit later. But in each one of these, the last to speak is always Jesus. So, who's last? Yeah. Also, if you go toward the end of Jesus' life, it looks like uh, death, evil, um, human sin and weakness are going to have the last word, doesn't it? Until you get to Sunday morning. And who has the last word? Yeah. Yeah, God does in raising his son. So lots of ways that who's last uh, is written all through this. And also with what I'm going to do with the word joy. So, one of my favorite discoveries, we want to talk about discoveries for a minute. One of my favorite discoveries was yesterday, we were, Billy and I had talked about, God wants his people to go to the Dillard house. It, I mean, it's written, thou shalt go to the, so we were thinking about going until we realized how many people from Atlanta were on 400. But we wanted to see the trees, so we went onto our back porch. <laughs> One of my other discoveries is the chart that I used back in the Revelation series. Some of you got it in black and white. That discovery of more than 63,000 connections between the Old and New Testaments still amazes me, and I'm so grateful for it, because I have all these books that have it, but I'm a visual person. And I got to see the rainbow of these magnificent connections between all the scriptures that Jesus uses and has written about him and where they're found in the Old Testament. It's uh, what a gift. Another uh, unexpected kind of thing uh, is that I find dryer sheets. I don't know if you've ever done that, but, but if, you, if you wear anything long-legged or long-sleeved, you're going to find a dryer sheet, and sometimes in other places. Another discovery occurred for me. I don't remember. I said almost a voting age. I don't know how old I was, but for years, I thought the opening line of the 23rd Psalm was, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want him. No, I did. Nobody ever explained to me that it was the Lord is my shepherd, 
I, I shall not want anything for he provides. And if somebody doesn't tell an early teenager, well, you can't tell much anyway, but you know, nobody ever told me. So I thought in my adolescent, can I say adolescent rebellion? Is that, yeah. yeah some of you are still working on that, aren't you? Um, I am. But I thought it was the Lord is my shepherd. Don't want him, don't. Does that make any sense? I know it doesn't make sense, but does that make sense? That somebody would be that confused. Um, and then I read the psalm, a tribute to the faithfulness of God in our lives. Um, the other discovery for today are, are the groups of people trying to trap Jesus. Um, or to embarrass him. Or to bring Rome down on him. That was, that was one of the ploys that they were using. Or to have religious authorities persecute him. I have a list from Dr. Megan McKenna on the Old Testament. Don't ever try to speak French in France. <laughs> because what you did in high school and college, they will rebuke. Um, unless you are one of those remarkable people who's able to do that. I wasn't. So, milieu. <laughs> So this is her address on New Testament milieu in which Jesus' ministry began. The dominant religious groups, number one, Pharisees. Um, but before we get to them, a much smaller group we met last week called the Herodians. They were what I call the peace at any price guys. What they really wanted was to do public acknowledgement and almost worship of King Herod so they would be rewarded. Now that doesn't happen in politics today. But it was rampant back then. Uh, so the king, the emperor, the, the folks in charge had a little herd always scurrying around them, uh, making noises. Then we have the Pharisees who separated themselves from anyone who was not faithful to their interpretation of the law and traditions. They formed closed communities for they believed they were the only faithful remnant of the original Israel. That can be dangerous. They followed one simple rule. God only loves and rewards those who keep the law, but God hates and punishes those who don't. And they went after Jesus on a regular basis. You, you are aware of that name, Pharisee. Then there were the Sadducees. My mom said they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. Actually, that, that's accurate. They did not believe in the resurrection. They were mostly members of aristocratic families and controlled a great deal of what happened or did not happen on the temple in Jerusalem. So Sadducee, temple. Pharisee, law. Then there were the zealots. They were named for a stabbing dagger. Judas Iscari. Judas Iscari is the, the dagger. You use it for toga stabbing. You greet, hey, how are you? Good to see you. And you rip them. That's what a zealot was for. They believed that anybody who submitted to Rome should be killed. And they did a pretty good job of, uh, of doing that. And then finally, the, the group that's mentioned are the Essenes. They're more like a group of monks who didn't trust city life. <laughs> Sorry. Who, did not, uh, who despised politics involved in the temple. For at that time, you could buy your religious office. Yeah. Yeah, what a mess. They believed themselves to be right, and everybody else was wrong, and everybody else had debt. They were not going to a hot hell, but they believed in a frozen hell. I'm still studying that. That's trying to get my. I believe we call that Northern Canada. <laughs> Jesus encountered these characters in a never ending parade that reminds me of the Albert and Costello skit of Who's on Third? Who's on First? So that's really where the title of the sermon came, Who's Last? Pharisees seem to leave the, lead the pack while in turn the others step in to try and harass Jesus or judge him. Our scripture for the morning reveals that the Sadducees have been whipped. Um, they're finished. They're never going to come back at Jesus again. So the Pharisees are operating as a pack of wolves. They're on their own this morning. And they bring to Jesus, again, a question. Remember, all three of these in, uh, in Matthew 22 are questions that they, they say, these are innocent questions, Jesus. We're just asking because we wanted to know. This time, they send a graduate from the Harvard Law School. And that ought to tell you something. 
They didn't trust anybody who graduated from either Georgia State or MRSA. <laughs> Jesus' answer to what is the greatest commandment is critical. It's worth hearing. This is from the NIV, Matthew twenty-two thirty-four to 40. Would you hear the word? And hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Question mark. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. For all the law... And all the prophets hang on these two commandments. Did you hear the importance of that to Jesus? All the law and all the prophets hang on these two. All. Love the Lord with all comes from the Shema. The word means listen. Therefore, the quote by Jesus from Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, Love the Lord with all, admonishes all who would hear to also listen. Are you aware of the difference between those two things? Yeah, you know, sometimes we think we hear and we're not paying any attention. You could speak to my wife about that. Love your neighbor comes from Leviticus. That, that was humor, by the way, well, marriage humor. Love your neighbor comes from Leviticus 19.18 and closes an admonition to not hate or take revenge on a neighbor. Now, I grew up with those two Old Testament quotes, the two Hebrew Scripture quotes, emblazoned on my soul and spirit. I knew exactly what they meant. I knew precisely what they required. I was giving a talk, a speech, a sermon one time, and, and there was a guy there that I didn't know very well, and, and I had suggested they take a note. I want to write something down. Later, he admitted to me that he was going to take a mental note, but he didn't have anything to write on. <laughs> that actually happened. I didn't make that one up. So, sketch with your mind, or some of you are actually taking notes, right? The word God is huge. It's written at the top. It's centered. God, written there, Lord. Now, this is what I was taught, what I learned for all those years. Then the word neighbor is centered almost as large under the word God. And then me, myself, I is last. And it's always written in tiny letters. So, gigantic God, large neighbor, little me. You with me? That's how I grew up. And they even had a bumper sticker called Joy. Jesus, others, you. That's how I grew up. Uh, I thought that was the way it was, it is, and always shall be. And to tell you the truth, I have discovered that it's wrong. I was wrong. May I tell you what I have discovered and what's been revealed to me? So... God is still centered, large, giant letters, huge, massive. And then, from God, a triangle. So that myself and my neighbor are equal in the sight of God. Are you with me? Instead of a straight line, I've ended up with a triangle, which I don't understand. I just know it makes sense to me, and may I tell you why? Yeah. If I do not know the love of God for myself, I will never love my neighbor. If I do not know the forgiveness of God, I will never forgive my neighbor. And remember, neighbor means a whole lot more people than folks in the house next to you. You with me? Yeah. Now, what keeps us from loving ourselves I think it's we do not know ourselves forgiven. Here's my formula. May I share it with you? We come to know the forgiveness and love of God for ourselves. We worship him, we adore him, we bless him, we read his word. And out of that experience and through the help and prayers of other people, we come to know that the one who knows me best loves me most. That'd be worth a song, wouldn't it? That'd be almost worth singing. In return, we learn to love God with our whole selves. And as a result of being loved and forgiven, we come to know that we can give away this powerful, forgiving, gracious love to someone else. 
and I think that's how it's supposed to work. I want to offer two books. I want to offer a quote and then tell you a story. May I do that? Now, I'm supposed to tell you books. I'm supposed to. I don't get kickback, by the way. The first I discovered, wow, almost 30 years ago, I guess. The man's name is Brennan Manning. Uh, he, became a, he became an alcoholic after he became a Christian. He has a story that's worth... The, the book is not fun because he tells the truth. But in the book called The Ragamuffin Gospel, he said that all believers in Jesus Christ are ragamuffins. And it's called The Ragamuffin Gospel, Brennan Manning, M-A-N-N-I-N-G. It's a book about learning to love and forgive ourselves. And I think it's important because a lot of our culture doesn't do that. A lot of our culture, especially uh, religious says basically you need to deny yourself, put yourself down in order to elevate and raise your neighbor. And I just, I think that's wrong. I don't think that's what God had in mind. Brendan Manning, it's not an easy, it's not an easy book. Let me, wait. It's a simple book, but it ain't easy. Yes? The second book, and you have a, a, a friend of mine was my lay leader in a church. Sometimes that's dangerous. And he talked about the number of insults that were included in the bulletin that day. There were actually inserts. You have an insert. <laughs> well, uh, so his name is David Augsburger, uh, dead now, a Mennonite from Indiana, Illinois area. Mennonites, wonderful folks. He's written a, a series of books called Caring Enough, Caring Enough to Love. This one's called Caring Enough to Forgive. And the unique thing about it, you look at one side, it's called Caring Enough to Forgive, True Forgiveness. And if you start reading the book, you get to the middle, and it's upside down, requiring you to turn the book over. Caring Enough to Forgive, False Forgiveness. And in that insert that you have, um, thank you, Matt, and others, th there's an error that, that I did on purpose. Look at the last line of False Forgiveness, if you would, for a moment. And then you'll take your mental pen and strike out not magical fantasy. It's not forgiveness. It's a magical fantasy. You see the word not there? By ma yeah. That word needs to be struck out. Okay? He's saying that false forgiveness, whoa, false forgiveness, which in our culture, whoa, one of the toughest things I've ever dealt with was anger because you're just not supposed to be angry. Anybody with me at all? Are, are, are you with me? I think not being able to be angry about things gets in the way of our forgiving. It has for me most of my life, and that, that's new for me. I'm still, I'm still working on I mean, this is, this is like it, it happened recently, but I'm glad it did. And some of the things we do with our anger, uh, we think we can alcohol it away, have affairs, spend money. Are anybody with me yet? We can do a number of self-destructive things in order not to be angry. Uh, we want it calmed down and anesthetized. We would like something to be a shot or a drug that would take our anger away. But I don't think, and I'm not talking about taking that out on somebody else. Therapy, counseling, somebody you trust with your very life that you can share with and talk with. And I encourage you, Mr. Wesley formed what were called accountability groups. He called them BANDS, B-A-N-D-S. And the first question you asked when you met with your small accountability group was, how is it with those braves? No. How is it with Georgia Tech football? How is it with your soul? The first question, and the only question that actually mattered, was what's happening between you and God? And uh, all of our small group stuff today is based on Jesus' model of 12, you with me? And then Mr. Wesley, whom, uh, whom I like to follow. So, learning to love, I-N-G, learning to love, it's a life process, Yes? 
Therefore, forgiveness is a life process, and dealing with anger is a life process. But I think until we begin that journey, we are crippled. I think we're not as healthy as God intended for us to be. And uh, we can talk about that. The quote comes from a man that I admired so much because he wrote the most honest book on grief that I've ever read. His name is John Claypool. Um, (laughs) The interesting thing about John, he was a famous Southern Baptist preacher in the South. Now, you can't get any more famous than that, right? Are you with me? I'm saying he was... He became an Episcopal pastor in Alabama. They're not as popular. The sermon is entitled, Learning to Forgive Ourselves. First time I ever read a sermon that dealt with it honestly, just like David Augsburger's book. Learning to Forgive Ourselves by Dr. John Claypool. A long quote. Would you hear a quote from John We all have shadows and skeletons in our backgrounds. But listen, there's something bigger in this world than we are. And that something bigger is full of grace and mercy and patience and ingenuity. The moment the focus of your life shifts from from your badness to his goodness. The moment your life shifts from your badness to his goodness And the question becomes not what have I done, but what can he do? Then remorse can happen. Release from remorse can happen. Miracle of miracles, you can forgive yourself because you're forgiven. Let me do that one again. Miracle of miracles, you can forgive yourself. Why? How? Because you're forgiven. You accept yourself because you're accepted. Paul Tillich, famous sermon. You you can begin to start building up the very places you used to tear down. Isn't that gorgeous? Some of us tear each other down, yes? Now, come on, come on, folks. Some of us tear each other down, yes? Uh, Or a group of people we tear down, or a group of people we persecute. Others of us tear ourselves down. I'm going to tear myself down before you have a chance, is how it runs. Anybody say amen? There is grace to help in every time of trouble. There is grace to help in every time of trouble. The secret to that grace is being able to forgive ourselves. Trust God's grace. John Claypool, learning to forgive ourselves. Now, may I tell you a story of where love and forgiveness have met in my life? May I do that? Count with me. 16, 15, 14. Count with me. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. What's the longest time you've ever gone without seeing or hearing from somebody that you love? Not to have a contest with you. But 16 years for me, 16 years between the last time I saw our son John and Christmas two years ago when I got to see him for the first time in 16 years on television, on Zoom. I had not seen our son in 16 years. 16 years because he had moved to Seattle, Washington, and in that move he had decided to erase all traces of himself and all the ways you can usually stay in touch with somebody through social media, telephone addresses, any, any of the things that we would think are normal ways of contacting a human being. John's very bright, very skilled, very IT savvy. He knew how to disappear, and he did it well. I didn't have any of those. What I did was want to see my son. I needed to see him. I hurt because he was gone. I had lost a daughter to death in 1995, and now my other child, my son John, seemed to be gone as well. And Billy walked and shared she was not John's birth or Leslie's birth mother, but she carried them. Anybody say amen? What I did have was a letter that John had written me probably 18 years earlier, four pages long. I still have the letter. 
four pages in which he listed all the hurts and wounds and scars and charges against me as a father, as a man, as a dad. It's the letter that your therapist tells you to write and then trash. Anybody with me? John mailed it. And I took it into my guts and into my heart and into my soul and wanted to destroy my life because I lost one child and now I'm going to lose another. It was almost more than I could bear. I could not and did not answer his letter for what I'd lost was my relationship with my son. Sixteen years passed and nothing from or about John. Then one day an envelope arrived in the mail. No return address. I hesitated, but Billy saw the handwriting. She said, it's from our ex-daughter-in-law, Laurie, was married to John, and less than eight months later they were divorced, and she came back to Atlanta from Seattle, and we have maintained a friendship with her. Can, can you do that with an ex-person in your life? Yeah, you can. So we had a good relationship, and um, the card inside had John's name, address, and phone number in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> It happened, <laughs> now this is a coincidence of course, it happened that a real estate company still had Lori on file as a person to contact if John had business stuff going on, like buying a house. They had contacted her to update that information and she decided to send it to us. I took a breath that lasted two months. I was terrified, I was frightened, I was scared. I hesitated to act. One day, I was led to take out the four-page letter from John, and I began to answer and ask forgiveness for every wound, hurt, scar, and charge against me in that letter. I answered every one of them. I explained how I had done and saw and felt and did and what it meant, but I made real sure that I asked him to forgive me. Uh, that was tough because I want to be defensive. How many of you are good at being defensive? Anybody? Or, or you're married to somebody? No. No, I, I think you didn't raise your hand, but you're not really telling the truth. We're all defensive. We all get defensive. And, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to point out um, I didn't. And I was so thankful that I didn't. I wrote him asking him to forgive me. And I closed with, I want to have a relationship with you. And I'm willing to do anything you need or require me to do for that to happen. And I signed your father, David. And I included my social security number, all of our credit card numbers, my former post office box in another city, the name of the dog that we had. I that was a little humor. I included every way that he could contact me, past, present, and future. Um, hmm. Three days after I mailed the letter, my phone rang. And because of Laurie's postcard, I recognized the number. I got a phone call. I fought back tears enough to answer, and for the first time in 16 years, I heard the voice of my son. He said, I got your letter, and I want to talk. So in September 2021, we began very hesitantly to talk. I was so scared that I would mess all this up again. I don't know about you, but I carry around some weight out of the past. And part of that weight is, well, I, I messed up then, I'll probably mess up. Anybody with me? Yeah. I thought that I stumbled because of my feet. But it was my heart. So, I had friends, I had family, and especially two small groups of men. with whom I regularly meet, to begin praying for me and for John. They were particularly praying for this newly birthed relationship, and four months later, on Christmas Day of 2021, the rest of our family gathered at our home here in Cumming. We had the largest television that you can possibly have, hmm. and had a Zoom meeting with John. The screen came up, and he was sitting in his office in Seattle, Washington. We spent an hour with him. I saw my son for the first time in 16 years. He came to Atlanta to visit with us, coming to visit with us in summer of 2022, 
and we in turn flew to Montreal, Canada to spend a week with him there. And in April of this year, 2023, we met John at the airport in Tel Aviv, Israel, and had two weeks in Israel and Jordan with him. He arrived three weeks ago in Nashville, Tennessee, where he will hang out until December, and then he will come and spend part of the month of December, especially for Christmas, with us. And just so you know, we're going to kill a fatted calf. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.